Hello, everybody. Anthony Bartolo, Senior Cloud Advocate with Microsoft, and thank you for joining me today. This is one of my favorite sessions to deliver, Applying AI and IoT to Save Lives, How a Team at Microsoft Made Drones Self-Aware. What I love about this most is that we're going to walk through real-world scenarios and implementations of machine learning, cognitive services, IoT. We're not going to go, this is what developers do, this is what IT pros do. We're gonna talk about what we do together as an organization, whether it be a small uh, systems integrator, whether it be a development shop, whether it be an organization that's trying to make heads or tails of technology and services that are out there and how they address opportunities or problems with technology. We're gonna show, like I said, real world examples and implementations. And we're also gonna share source code and if not source code, steps on replicating a lot of the demos that you're gonna to see today. So let's get started. All right. Apologies. Let's get started with the presentation. So before we jump into the technologies that are available out there, we want to start with how do we get to this point? How did we get to this point in terms of services that are available for us to implement? This was a journey that's taken over you know, numerous years in terms of where we're at today. Previous to computing was a destination. You would go to your den or your computer room or your office. You would have you know, access to a computer that would be sitting on a desktop. It may or may not have been connected to the internet or at that time, BBSs or uh, forums uh, that you would dial into over a uh, te telephone modem. Uh, you know, my first computer was bought at a local retailer here in Canada and, you know, was bought off the shelf, was the Commodore 64 and connected it to the, you know, the internet via telephone line. Um, gaming was pixelated, right? It wasn't interactive. It was singular. Um, you, if you had, did have a multiplayer, you had the ability to connect via um your your computer itself and have two joysticks to to be able to play uh <laughs> gaming on phones is nothing like what it was today i remember playing snake uh on my my on my nokia uh, device and you know that was the extent of graphics and even better still in terms of communication there was no real correlation between you know communication and connectivity at that time other than you know telephone dial up through a a, a 9600 baud modem uh you know the whole aspect of the mobile phone being released it was a big uh, bulk unit that you know you would have to carry uh around and it wouldn't fit on your hip and or if it was in the vehicle it was hardwired into the vehicle these are the things that you know where computing was at back in the day and then this happened and so when the blackberry 950 was released the the beauty of it is the you know the device provided you information at your hip and it's it's all about the information that's the biggest piece of this right it's the data Let's, let's set aside the fact that this has a QWERTY keyboard and you know it ran off a, a single AA battery uh, and it had three days worth of connectivity. The big thing with this device was the ability to have your email at your fingertips at all times. I don't have to go to a computer anymore to gain access to my data. This was powerful. This was something where it changed the perception of what computing was and what we could start doing. And this is where the catalyst of the capturing of data started to occur in terms of what if information could be made available everywhere? What if you know these devices could provide us indications in terms of the best routes to travel or the best restaurants to go to? Um, or when is it time to do maintenance on a um, large large scale machinery? This is where you know the, the, it really changed in terms of paradigm in terms of what is computing and what is you know services and what are what is data actually what can data actually do to better the lives of everyone? So a couple of quick stats I wanted to share with everybody. In 2018, there were 7 billion IoT devices connected. So, you know, we went, we went from this BlackBerry 950 to now, you know, 7 billion IoT devices collecting information, collecting data. In 2020, there was 32 billion devices. So you can see in, in two years' time, the extramental growth that's happening with regards to this scenario of, you know, now we're growing to the point where we're capturing all this information. What are we doing with this information is the biggest question. There's estimation by 2030, 80 billion devices are going to be connected, providing us information about the world around us, right? It, it, it's something where, you know, all this data is being captured about everything that we do and everything that we experience, the way we drive our cars, the way we experience concerts, uh, the way we get medical care at hospitals. You name it, you know, all this information is being correlated and captured and what have you. And what's interesting is that 80% of the world's data was captured within the last two years. For all the technology that we've had, for all the uh, abilities that we've had, 
in the last two years, 80% of the data that we've captured, you know, for around the world has, has happened in the last two years. That's, that's because of the evolution of everything that's going on, because of the connectivity that's being, being available over cellular, over landlines, you know, live streaming, it, it, I would say, what, three, four years ago, it's difficult to do something like this uh, over a live stream. And now we're able to do this over residential internet access. It's, it's, you know, the times are really evolving really quickly. And so it's up to us to ensure that, you know, when we do things like this, we really pay attention in terms of what we're trying to accomplish and we do it in a responsible way. And we'll talk a little bit about that in this presentation as well. So here's the next big juncture that we're at. It's artificial intelligence. And everybody has this on their tip of their tongue in terms of what do I do with artificial intelligence? You know, I like to say, you know, I want to rub a little bit of our artificial intelligence on my product and it's going to excel, right? That's not necessarily the case. You know, a lot of people see artificial intelligence as the next greatest, you know, money saving uh, solution. If I bring in artificial intelligence to my organization, I'm going to be able to save money. A lot of people talk about artificial intelligence taking over people's jobs. You know, there's a lot of, you know, perceptions in terms of what our artificial intelligence is. But what I want to talk to you about today is let's see how artificial intelligence is, is included in the examples that I'm going to give. I don't want it to be the, you know, the main premise of what we're trying to accomplish. It is interwoven into the stories that will be shared today. I want to showcase how in focusing on the problem or opportunity first is where artificial intelligence then comes into play as a tool to address that opportunity as opposed to an end goal or a focus point as to where I want to go. So when we talk about, you know, capturing of data and we can talk about what we're going to do with the data, this is the first topic that usually comes up when I have these type of discussions, right? It's, I need to connect this to this. I need to get information from that. You know, we've heard situations in terms of uh, connecting the IoT devices to cows to understand when's the best time to milk them to produce the most milk or connecting IoT devices to buses to understand what's the best travel patterns uh, in terms of avoiding traffic and making sure that they're at their stops on time. You know, you hear about these discussions all the time, but one crucial item to this is always missed in regards to this scenario. It's the people involved, and that's huge. You have to have, you know, the business decision makers, the developers, and the IT professionals all come together in terms of these opportunities and understanding the problems as a whole. Don't just add technology for the sake of adding technology. Add technology for the sake of understanding the problem, understanding what everybody's ideas are and how they need to face the problem in their specific way, and then add technology as a tool to address the opportunity or the problem instead of running with, I need to install this at my organization so I can make more money or save more money or be more proficient or whatever that goal is. Do it from the flip side. I need to be, you know, I need to save money at this organization because we're spending a lot on X and here are the tools that are available to me. Let's hear, you know, in terms of everybody's opinion and everybody's need in terms of this type of implementation. And let's add that uh, as a tool, as part of our plan, as opposed to having that as our focal point, which is very important. So I'm going to share with you one of my first projects that I implemented uh, with IoT, and I want to show how this naturally evolved into including artificial intelligence as opposed to starting at that point. So a long time ago, we were um, a group of five of us were put forth with a challenge in terms of take some you know everyday objects, everyday ideas, and try to connect them and try to start capturing data for a specific purpose. It wasn't a you know go and do an IoT project, go and do an AI project. It was get your creative creative juices flowing and, and try to solve a real world problem with technology. So the group and I, you know, sat around, we talked about, you know, opportunities in terms of what we could accomplish. And the facility that we were at was a big warehouse. And it was something where we had thought of, you know, I wonder if they ever have issues with, you know, vermin like rats and mice and what have you. And, you know, we walked around the building and we, lo and behold, we saw traps, you know, these big black boxes uh, that the mice would go in and not come back, not come back out. And, you know, it was something that was an eyesore and we started walking around to see how many of these that we could, we could actually find, um, you know, and they're not pleasant to look at. They're not, you know, and it, we, we talked to the pest control company that services these traps. Uh, they come out at regular intervals to, to um, eliminate the vermin uh, that are trapped in the traps. Uh, can you imagine at a restaurant to have these boxes around and, you know, just sitting there and it could be full, could be empty with mice or what have you. It, it's something of concern, right? So understanding the opportunity as a whole was very important 
for us. It was all about, you know, understanding that, you know, vermin, when they, when they uh, infiltrate an area, uh, they can bring over 35 diseases. You know, they, they, the traps, they're, they're cleaned out at intervals, not if they're full or not, right? So this is something where, wow, you have all this going on. And, you know, what are you doing to be more proactive in terms of cleaning out these traps? What are you doing to be more proactive to getting rid of the vermin that's at that location, uh, as opposed to just, hey, you know, it's Tuesday at three o'clock, I have to go out and clean out these traps, right? Um, the other aspect to this was the revenue opportunity with this. Uh, the industry for pest control is is $12 billion annually, uh, and it's, it has an annual growth of 3.1% year over year. So that's a huge opportunity in regards to if you are more proficient at clearing out these traps uh, and having that ability to go forth and make your customers ha much more happier. Uh, implementing a solution like this might be it might be the ticket to do that. So we connected these mouse traps, and it, and it was just literally a, a two dollar mouse trap. I have it here um, via um, local retailer. Uh, connected it to a Raspberry Pi, and what it in essence did was it captured information in terms of how long until it caught a mouse, and how long till the trap was uh, cleared of the mouse. And that was our, you know, our, our SLA marker that we would have is in terms of the time that it would, it would take for someone to go and clear out the mousetrap. Uh, just to let you know, no, no har mice were harmed uh, in this scenario when we did an actual test of the deployment. We did the um, trap where it would be a, a, a trapping them inside of the box uh, as opposed to having the, the, the device snap on them, uh, which was a lot more humane. Uh, in that scenario there, what we were able to do then was to, um, to put the, the mouse traps out uh, in the vicinity and test out, you know, hey, these traps in this end of the uh, of the of the building or this end of the room were catching a lot more mice than the other end of the room. So we only had the information at the time in terms of when the trap was set off and when the trap was uh, released uh, or or emptied. Uh, what if we were able to capture more information? So we started to explore. We can capture, you know, the level of light uh, that was there or the temperature uh, of the uh, around the area. And we took that information, we correlated it into, you know, machine learning to understand the variables of, you know, where are the best places to put the mouse traps inside of a building? So we tied it into, you know, the whole aspect of machine learning to understand, okay, in this room here, you know, if we put the mice, mouse traps in these areas, as been told of us by uh, machine learning, we will catch more mice. And we were actually able to then uh, report in terms of how the mouse traps are doing via Power BI and correlating that data to, to, to better understand what is the travel pattern of mice throughout this room or throughout this building to and put on, out these mouse traps to be more proficient at catching the mice and you know this then lets the pest control companies know hey i need to put these traps in these certain areas to catch the most mice because you know when i put a trap here it's, it's more likely to catch the mice and having it proficiently then notify the pest control company that say hey 60% of your traps are full, 70% of your traps are full, 80% of your traps are full, you should come clean them out. Um, even predicting in terms of the time to catch 80% of mice so that the pest control company can be proactive as opposed to, oh, it's Tuesday at 3 p.m., I have to go and, and you know, empty the traps. They can know that, hey, in about three hours, I'm gonna have to go to this location to empty the traps. And so their customers are much more satisfied to understand that, hey, the pest control company is coming out when the traps are, are gonna be full as opposed to being at a specific interval. And then these traps are no longer working because the traps are full and they're not catching any more mice. Uh, so it was an op awesome uh, experiment to run through. Uh, here is all the information that pertains to this solution. We've made the entire solution open source. And what I love about this and why I love sharing this, this presentation is every time I've shared this presentation, the solution has evolved. Yes, I've seen a lot of implementations of the mousetrap scenario in this type of solution. But it has evolved to other facets of businesses out there based on the mousetrap scenario and architecture, which is really cool. So let me share you one, one example. As mentioned, you know, the key to this was the evolution of the solution from just, you know, knowing when the mousetrap was, was uh, full and notifying us when the, tra the trap was full to add it, the addition of machine learning to evolve the solution, to make it that much better, to make it that much proficient at not only catching mice, but to be more proactive at emptying out the traps so that the traps are always available to catch more mice. So in the, with the inclusion of machine learning, a lot of organizations uh, we've talked to have taken up uh, this solution and have implemented in different ways that we find unique. And one of the stories I like to share uh, is a sweet one. It's ice cream trucks. Uh, these are the ice cream trucks that travel around uh, Toronto. Um, I know, you know, 
parts of North America probably have the same trucks, actually part around the world, uh, I've seen trucks like these. Uh, in Toronto specifically, these are the ice cream trucks that we see uh, every year in, during the summer uh, traveling around. Uh, and the challenges that they have are, how are they more uh, most proficient in terms of selling of ice cream? Right, it's you know it's hard. It's, it, there's there's costs in terms of the gas. There's costs in terms of the operation of the ice cream machine that's inside of the truck. There's the individual that's working 15, 16 hours a day, trying to make a living. Uh, it's not an easy feat. Using the same architecture that we had with the mouse trap, they were able to do the correlation of instead of the mouse trap being set off or having a certain weight uh, notifying that they've captured a, a certain amount of mice. They've actually taken the trigger and it and, and put the trigger with the um, the song or the chime that act, the ice cream truck would play when it travels through a neighborhood. So this is the interesting piece with this: when the truck is moving slowly, uh, because there's a speed factor in, involved as well, and the music is being played via the truck itself. That is the trigger to say, well, the truck is in motion. It's not really servicing its customers. It's just you know trying to draw attention to itself. And then when the truck stops because it sees that there's individuals there, the, you know, the, the, the music that's turned off, that's the trigger to then calculate how much time is this individual with the truck staying in that specific area and servicing customers and doing that calculation. Uh, and in future, they're going to correlate that to sales as well in terms of how many sales are actually happening at the location as well. And they can now pinpoint at what times of the day is the best places to be at certain locations to sell the most ice cream. And at what days? So, you know, you, you might have this. So here's a hot spot that we have here um, in terms of the Toronto area in Burlington during a certain time. As you can see, there's a star there uh, to go there during a certain time to sell the most ice cream and then travel across the bridge uh, to the other side into Hamilton uh, and do the same thing and, and have that scenario. This makes the ice cream trucks, trucks more proficient in selling of ice cream uh, and doing so in the least amount of expense in terms of gas in terms of travel time uh, and allowing the vendors that are selling the ice cream to be more proficient at doing so. And this is this is huge in respect to, you know, if they're more proficient in selling, selling ice cream, it costs them less to, to operate the, the, the vehicle itself. They make the income that they're trying to make. Uh, it, and, they, and more people are happy because you get ice cream. You're, you're always happy uh, if you have some sweets to, to gnaw on, which is awesome. Uh, but what's interesting about this is this is based on the, the mousetrap solution. It is the same architecture infrastructure, just customized in a different way, using different type triggers, but same logic which was really interesting. And I love seeing how these solutions evolve to do something more and something better beyond what we initially started um, in terms of the, the solution. That's why I love the, the whole open source um, aspect of technology in that people can evolve things to something more. So another project that we did, uh, again, this is based on the learnings that I've had and the experiences that I've had was working with Toyota Canada. And one of the challenges Toyota Canada had was, you know, they wanted to be more proficient at understanding, you know, what parts in a vehicle could break down uh, in terms of being more proactive in with regards to uh, uh, recalls on vehicles, recalls on parts. And so in this scenario here, we actually sat down with the team. Uh, they had 300 locations across Canada in terms of shops that would be, you know, providing information manually to uh, Toyota Canada. And they would capture this information and they would massage it as best they can. It could take them weeks to go through as much data as they were capturing on specific vehicles. And it was interesting to see the exercise and the fact that all the information was being ingested in through access, uh, which was crazy to see in the amount of data that they were receiving. And this was an interesting endeavor uh, in terms of, let's take the data, let's put it into a, a much uh, more massageable database like, like SQL on Azure, and then have the exercise to understand the variables that a, a park could break down in. So it could be, you know, the weather that's out there or the road conditions in the specific area. Taking that information, correlating that that open source information in terms of road data, weather data, what have you, and correlating that to the parts inside of a vehicle uh, and the percentages of failure that it could occur based on the stress of those parts inside of the vehicle. Um, this was a very interesting exercise. We were the catalyst to, to start this alongside Toyota Canada. I know they've taken it a lot further than what we started with uh, in respect to this. But what I love about this is we've taken these learnings and we've created a lab out of this scenario. And this is if you're trying to get your first foot 
uh, into the door in terms of machine learning and understanding that the possibilities are there. Uh, we worked on this with Toyota Canada, not on part failure, but it was on pricing of vehicles, uh, which is an interesting interesting endeavor uh, to go through in terms of if the vehicle has you know X, Y, and Z in terms of parts or features or functionality, what should be the cost of the vehicle that's going out there? So if you go to aka.ms forward slash autolab, you'll get a full you know run through of a lab uh, that you can actually understand. You know, And, and again, this is extended from the learning of the mousetrap into the solution that we've done with Toyota Canada to understand how do we ingest the data? How do we massage the data? How do we train the model? Uh, it's a great step by step to go through. I use this you know, in regards to teaching others and, and the adoption of machine learning and to see it from the perspective of how am I doing this to better you know, put forward my organization to address opportunities and getting those ideas in terms of how that can be implemented in organizations, which is, which is key. So we talked about, you know, the whole aspect of the ingestion of information coming from, coming in from IoT devices, going up to the cloud, uh, having that scenario where you have this connectivity that can push that data to the cloud and then be digested through solutions like machine learning uh, for the incorporation of artificial intelligence to have an outcome of X, whatever X may be. But what happens when you have the challenge that the device itself cannot be connected, right? Or it can only be connected during certain intervals. You have, you know, there's there's things that you have to take into consideration when you're looking at these type of opportunities or solutions where, you know, there might be a cost involved or a huge cost involved in terms of the information being pushed up to the cloud. With as much data as we're capturing now from these devices, does it make sense to send all 100% of the raw data up to the cloud to be digested? Or should we look at a scenario where we incorporate edge computing to have an a base understanding of the data that we're capturing at the at the uh, endpoint, uh, which could be the IoT device or a mobile device, you know, smartphones, you name it, capturing that information. We're now seeing the utilization of compute cycles coming right at the endpoint itself to do rudimentary calculations on X, whatever that may be. So in the case of the mousetrap, uh, you know, understanding that the, the mousetrap has been set off. Initially, what would happen is the trap would set off, it would, it would complete the trigger, it would push that information, that raw information to the cloud, and the cloud would say, yes, it was set off, or no, it wasn't set off. Uh, and then so it would do the, the timer in terms of when it was set off. Uh, in future iterations that I've seen the solution, I've seen that high school students are deploying, which is awesome. Uh, they're actually doing on the edge. So they're actually having the Raspberry Pi report out to say, yes, the trap has been set off. Uh, and this is the, in, the variables around there you know, this is how many mice I've captured and pushing the finalized information up to the cloud for calculation. This is beneficial in, in ways that, you know, now you have this scenario where I don't require 100% connectivity. So that saves a lot on costs. The device are a lot smarter on the endpoint, uh, so they can be more proficient at doing the tasks that they're doing. Uh, and it allows me to have cleaner data. I don't have all this raw data in terms of that I may not need all the stuff that I have to filter out before I do my machine learning exercise, which is awesome. So I wanted to show you an example of this so, uh, our team undertook. And this is uh, one of the boats on the coast, Canadian Coast Guard fleet called the Henry Larson. It's a large boat. Um, it goes out to sea you know, to help and search and rescue uh, boats that are in distress, but the people that are overboard. Uh, you know, crucial, crucial um, uh, solution that we have here in Canada. And you know, the same solution is available around the world. The big challenge here is, you know, there's only so many boats that we have. And Canada is a large line mass, you know, we're on two, two sides of an ocean, and it's the whole aspect of having enough resources to help save as many people as we can. And how do you become more proficient at that? And so this challenge was put forth to our, ourselves and a team uh, out in BC called Indro Robotics, where could we use artificial intelligence to aid in the uh, responsibility of search and rescue, right? So and put forth this question to our teams to come together and, and come up with a solution. This is where you know the drone aspect comes into play. Working with Indro Robotics, what we were able to do was to teach a drone to identify when a life jacket is in the water and to ensure that a body mass is actually inside of that life jacket so that's an actual individual uh, in the life jacket. So what had happened was the drone, you know, from, from a testing perspective and there's you know uh, regulations and rules required in terms of the flight a pattern the drone would have to take, the altitude the drone would have to fly at, the type of life jackets that the drone would have to recognize. You know, all this information was crucial to ensure the success of this endeavor. The other aspect to this is that these drones fly up to three hours out, out at sea. Uh, and, you know, at those, at those scenarios, there's no connectivity. And, you know, cellular doesn't even connect, have that type of connectivity. Uh, yes, you could do satellite, but 
the cost of including satellite in those type of scenarios uh, was was immense. And you know, trust me, when you're trying to save lives, you know, cost doesn't matter. But we also wanted to make sure that you know it would be feasible for organizations like the Canadian Coast Guard to deploy a plethora of these devices, as opposed to only a few because of budgetary constraints uh, this, that this allowed them to do so. So the, the piece here was having these drones, you know, these are gas powered, you know, full size drones going out three hours at sea uh, to a, a distress signal and then surveying the area. So, you know, um, there would be a, a, a manual pilot that would, you know, fly these devices out there to survey the area capture the film and then fly back to the central office to have the uh, film analyzed. And so the challenge was, how could we make the, the drone more proficient in understanding the data that it's seeing, as opposed to just simply flying it out there, capturing that data and flying it back to have the tape re uh, reviewed? You know, every second counts, especially if somebody's overboard, hypothermia could set in. These are a lot of the scenarios that you have to take in consideration when you're, you're trying to save lives. And so the team that you see here, you know, ran to the scenario where if we can build the intelligence into the drone to identify that individuals are, are actually off the boat and in the water, then we're in a dire situation where, you know, minutes count uh, in terms of getting the support out there, getting people out there. So in this scenario here, it was 500 man hours of having this drone go out there and film uh, the scenario and identify when a life jacket is, is in the water. And when you have that scenario, when a life jacket is detected in, in the water, it's, it needs to be more than that. It needs to be a scenario of, so the life jacket is there, okay, identified. Now is there an individual inside of that life jacket, right? And that's where the IR scan came into play. And this was big in terms of the learnings that we had, because remember, these drones had no connectivity. They were flying out there, uh, being remote controlled, going to a specific location, capturing this information, and now understanding what they were seeing when they were out in the water and understanding that hey there is a life jacket overboard hey there's you know an, an individual inside of that life jacket capturing environmentals was the next step and understanding you know is it cold is it hot what's going on and then doing a rudimentary calculation in terms of with the four individuals in the water time to contract hypothermia is x amount of minutes hours you name it uh, and this is how much time, you, this is the window that you have to go out and, and help um, help these people get out of the water and, and become safe. It was a very interesting experiment. We learned a lot from this experiment. But what I loved about this is that, you know, and, and their full write-up of this experiment as well is, is available at aka.ms4 slash drone AI, is the fact that, you know, we've shared our learnings with everybody. And everybody is now taking advantage of these learnings and grown the solution. But I want to actually show you the cognitive uh, solution scenario that we did in terms of the drone uh, and how we actually taught the drone through 500 people hours uh, of how they actually, you know, how the drones understood what a life jacket actually looked like. So let me go through the quick demo uh, for cognitive services and edge computing. So here we have the um, Custom Vision AI uh, Workbench. And this is the solution that I use to teach custom vision, in essence, artificial intelligence, to understand objects, right? So in this scenario here, we start off going to www.customvision.ai. And we start by adding images. Now, in this scenario here, we're not going to do the life jackets. We're going to do something that's uh, around a inventory of a hardware store, right? This is, you know, a challenge, especially that we're in right now. We're only limited to so many people that could be inside of an enclosed area. How do you do inventory uh, with, with the fact that you have less people? You take more time to do the inventory. You know, how can we utilize technology to help in the, these type of scenarios? And so we're going to do inventory on hammers. And so first thing we need to do is we need to teach the services to understand what a hammer looks like, right? Because hammers come in all different shapes and sizes. We know it's a blunt object at the top, usually metal, sometimes rubber if it's a mallet. Uh, and then there's a wooden um, handle that you would, you would uh, hold on to. So these are the images that I brought up through Bing imagery uh, and then save them into a repository and then manually inserted them one by one, I know. Uh, but I'm going to show you a solution at the end of this that can actually quicken this process. Um, but this, for this scenario here, taking of all these hammers, putting it into the solution, uh, and then teaching it by tagging each device, each image as a hammer. And then adding a wrench, right? So we know that, you know, wrench, they could be um, adjustable, they could be, you know, uh, a fixed format, uh, different sizes, usually all metal. 
uh, in regards to what they're done. I, I Trust me, I've a lot of times used the wrench as a hammer if I didn't have a, a hammer a handy. But definitely there's, you know, differences in terms of the, the, the makeup of the, the uh, wrench between a wrench and a hammer, uh, different sizes, different shapes, different looks. Um, all this being put into the custom vision.ai uh, solution, the workbench, to have an understanding between the differences of, of the hardware. And then training the model. And this is important, right? So now that we've tagged everything, we have to teach the services to understand the differences between the, the hardware uh, so that when they're, it's doing a, a deduction of what it's looking at, it can be specific and sort of, yep, this is, a, this is a hammer and this is a wrench. And so you you go through iterations, right? Iterations of learning, going through, do you want to get as high in terms of a percentage of you know um, reliability of your data, reliability of the recognition of the imagery that's there? And so in this scenario here, you know, the recall, the precision of, of understanding the data is at 100%. The recall was at 96%, which is very high. You know, again, this is a very small demo. In the case of the uh, the drone understanding the life jackets in the water, like I said, it was 500 people, people hours in, you know, different types of, uh, you know, visibility during the day, different types of weather patterns, uh, different types of, of water. Uh, sometimes the ocean is blue, sometimes it's green. You know, it, it affects the color of the life jacket. Even the life jackets themselves, you know, here's a life jacket that's brand new, the bright orange, and here's a life jacket that's 10 years old and it's faded, right? There was a lot of capturing of information that had to occur. And we actually had to do it all manually. It couldn't be automated for that scenario only because you had to do it in a real world implementation. You couldn't do it via imagery um, based on the regulations. And this is important too. Remember, it's not just about the inclusion of technology for the sake of including technology in an opportunity. You also have to abide by the rules and regulations that may occur or may be required for the operation or, or opportunity that you're addressing. So in this scenario here, now that we have the recall that we want, we're actually going to export the learnings. And this is where the edge computing piece comes into play. Traditionally, you would have the scenario where the raw data would be sent up to the cloud and it would, it, the, the cloud would do its deductions there. But in this scenario here, we're actually going to go forth and export the data. And as you can see from the solution, there's a facet, I'm oh, sorry, there's a plethora of solutions that you can actually export to. Uh, everything from IoT to TensorFlow, TensorFlow to Docker file. We're actually gonna export this into an Onyx file, which is an open source uh, decision-making solution made available. And I'm gonna show you why in a second. But what's powerful about this is the amount of choice that you have. So now that you've created this base learning file to understand the differences between a hammer and a wrench, you're taking this and you're exporting it out to make a device semi-intelligent, to provide it with the awareness to understanding, hey, this is what I'm actually looking at from a scenario of hardware between a wrench and a hammer itself. So I'm gonna export out this Onyx file and I'm gonna open up my application. Now this application here uh, is in, in Unity and it utilizes a device to understand what I've taught, in uh, what I've learned, sorry, inside of the Custom Vision AI uh, workbench taking that model and inserting it into the application. So something like a HoloLens can understand what it's looking at. Now, a HoloLens, traditionally, we, we're using it in scenarios where you have holographic images uh, in a mixed reality scenario and seeing that those imagery inside of the real world scenario. But how about utilizing these devices to understand what they're seeing? So in this scenario here, um, from this project with the, the wrench and hammer identification, we were able to do up to 75 objects being identified by the hall lens itself, which is huge. And this is, you know, obviously not a drone. I would love to showcase the drone for you, unfortunately, in the area that I'm in right now, I can't fly a drone. But what I love about this solution is how extendable it is. You, you know, we talked about this type of availability on, on, on the drone, uh, now ported it over to a hall lens. And there are a plethora of other devices that you can port the same scenario, same solution over to. Again, this is why I love sharing these, these projects because you know you are the, the person that will bring this to the next level or do the next thing uh, with this type of solution based on the opportunities and problems that you need to address. And to help you with that, you know, this is my GitHub repo that I've captured a lot of the projects that we've done uh, as a team. As you can go forth in aka.ms4 slash wireless life, replicate run through the code, provide me with suggestions in terms of how to make solutions better. I'm always eager to learn from you uh, in terms of what you're trying to accomplish and how I can provide you with resources to take it to the next step or do something more with the solutions that are out there. As mentioned, you know, I've done it in a scenario where it was automated, uh, sorry, in a manual way where I'm going through the custom vision.ai workbench to ingest all this information. I wanted to share, uh, Cassie has a great write-up 
uh, which can be found at aka.ms forward slash 10 minute, sorry, 10 min ML model uh, that will actually take imagery from Bing uh, and ingest it. So if I want, you know, I'll type in hammer and I'll type in wrench and it will automatically populate for me into customvision.ai to do the training on my behalf so that I don't have to go out and manually capture that information. You know, she offered this up as a solution to, to she saw my presentation and said, why are you doing it the long way? Why is it taking you so long? This is what I love, right? I love that people are willing to help and people are, co are coming out and growing the solution. And I want to share that with everybody uh, to take the ideas to the next level. Uh, so if you, you can do it the, the way I just showed you in terms of the, the adoption of custom vision uh, or Cassie's model, is, which is awesome, which automates a lot of the solution in terms of capturing information, especially if you have a plethora of hardware that you have to capture. You know, we just did a wrench and a hammer and get screwdrivers, you got crowbars, you, got, you know, you name it in terms of tools that are out there. Um, this is a much better and much quicker solution unless you have to do it manually, like what we what we had to do with the drones. That capture had to be done manually because it had to be done in a in a in a situ in a scenario where um, you know understanding where the life jacket was and different weather patterns and what have you. It's hard to grab that for imagery uh, as well as regulations required it to be live training, which was another thing that we had to address. So make sure when you're going through your solutions in your scenario, you're doing you're abiding by the rules and regulations that are required as well. So as mentioned, you know. We showcase this on HoloLens. We showcase this on a drone. It doesn't stop there. In essence, any device that can capture imagery, uh, can understand imagery, it can be utilized in the scenario. So this is the Azure uh, Azure uh, sorry Azure Kit, Connect Kit. That was a mouthful. The Azure Connect SDK uh, that's available uh, that you can acquire. It can capture information in IR. It can capture information in real real time imagery. Uh, you know the whole aspect of it understanding what it's looking at would require compute. Uh, functionality. So you would have to connect this device uh, to a, a, a central processing unit to understand and go through the calculation on the edge in terms of what it's looking at. Or if you you know, just wanted to have the, it as a standalone funneling information up to Azure, you can do that as well. Um, but I wanted to highlight this in terms of sky's the limit in terms of creativity, what you could do with the solutions that are being shared. It's not just about, hey, go out and get this device and replicate. It's grow on this see what opportunities can be addressed with this. If you're stuck at a problem right now, how can this be used as a tool inside of the, the solution that you want to put forth to grow? And, and you know, I usually find out when you're starting to address a problem, it grows, it, it, it evolves as you go along in terms of addressing it. And that's fine. And that's great. And that's how you learn more in terms of implementation of use of the technology. And, and the hope is that you share what you learn with the world so that everybody can take advantage. Uh, if you want to look into this kit, the URL is aka.ms forward slash Azure Connect DK. Uh, and this will give you the ability to not only acquire the devices that you require, uh, but also a lot of the templates that are used in terms of understanding what's going on uh, with the solution that's being put forth. So I wanted to showcase another solution in terms of the same type of implementation with the drone. In this scenario here, a group in Australia are actually using drones to do understanding of you know the soil moisture uh, or saturation of the soil uh, inside of the you know the farmer's fields. And this is big, right? If you have scenarios like droughts that are happening, you need you know specific water sources. You want to make sure that you're yielding the most amount of crops. I know that you know tomatoes need more water than corn, right? You know, understanding those different data points and levels uh, is is a big deal, and it's the whole aspect of you know being precise in terms of your your uh, water or moisture measurement. Uh, these drones will have that capability to do that, and had the automated response to to the irrigation system to say, "Yep, you're gonna have to turn the irrigation on because the soil is not saturated enough for the crop that's there." This is huge, right? It's the whole aspect of not replacing jobs. It's about yielding much more food, better food, you know, the, making sure that the, the the plants have the adequate resources to grow uh, and to be optimal uh, in terms of what they produce, right? And this is, again, what I love about this story is it's, you know, further utilizing the drone technology, further utilizing the, uh, co the cognitive services or custom vision AI um, capability in a new way to ensure that it addresses an opportunity and provides more opportunity down the road in terms of producing more food uh, for the world to consume. Uh, back to the hall lens and, and, and like again, this is us breaking off the, the initial drone scenario in terms of other opportunities that are there. We talked about this, right? The hall lens is, this, you know, the mixed reality implementation where I can look at holograms uh, that interact with the real world. What I loved about this solution was you have a scenario where piping is behind, you know, sheetrock or drywall, as we say here in Canada. And, you know, 
you don't know what's happening in terms of piping could be water pressure issues it could be you know a leak somewhere and you know traditionally what there is is you, you'd have indicators or you have a, a reporting station especially in large warehouses uh hey this is what your your water flow looks like how do you address this you know it's it's done manually right hopefully there's a uh a, a, a service door that you can go through to adjust the pressure as required through the valve we work with a, a group out of t4g to understand hey could we automate this type of solution from a scenario where as a uh, um, somebody that's going as an in inspector, wearing the hall lens, walking through an office building, a warehouse, what have you, understanding what the water flow was through the piping, and then taking it a step further to actually say, hey, I need to release pressure on this valve and I need to open it, doing it via hand gesture. Remember the hall lens is it's a new interface that you have to interact with data. Um, you know, similarly to what you would do on a smartphone on a, or on a laptop or, or a computer. But you have that scenario where the device is being worn. You're seeing the data in real time in front of you mixed with real world. Uh, you know, we've seen games and type of interaction. We've seen, you know, uh, support from a, a technical of working on a vehicle, working on an engine, having somebody, you know, uh, support you. It's a uh, Dynamics 365 type implementation. In this scenario here, you're actually walking through a building, looking at the pipework, in a virtual sense behind the sheetrock or drywall, and then having actuators on the valves to open and close as required due to pressure levels that you can see in here in the report. That's huge. It's another interface that you can now utilize. And in some scenarios, what I've learned from specific projects, the inspector actually has to be within a certain circumference of the machinery or the pipe uh, that they're looking at. So this solves that problem as opposed to bringing this laptop out or bringing a smartphone out uh, to do the adjustments manually on the device. You can actually do it via the hall end and see the the um, what's happening behind the walls without breaking the walls or even going into the service door, which is huge. Now, the last piece I want to touch on is the ethics of AI. And this is a very hot topic in regards to all the solutions and scenarios that are out there. Remember, you know, we talked about this earlier. The addition of technology shouldn't be the end point, shouldn't be the focal point of what you're trying to accomplish. At the end of the day, it's the relationship of people uh, and the opportunities that you're trying to address on their behalf, which, which should be the focal point. That means that you have to take ethics into consideration. And this is a hot topic because with all the information of capturing of, of data and AI, uh, it's the whole aspect of well, there's a lot of data. Should we be capturing that data? Right. I know there's a lot of, you know, scenarios in terms of facial recognition that becomes a challenge uh, in respect to having this this type of data that's out there. You got to be mindful of that. And this is this is the scenarios that you have to take in consideration uh, when you're deploying these type of solutions to ensure that it meets not only regulatory compliance, but it's acceptable that, you know, by the people that will be around when these types of solutions are rolled out for that type of implementation. So I wanted to share, you know, one last project with everybody in regards to a solution that we work with uh, with an organization uh, named Home Accept. And the challenge that they had was, you know, the, the the population is aging, and we're in a scenario where there, you know, there's a, a group that's out there right now is at a certain age. Um, you know, they want to live in their homes. They don't want to go to facilities. They don't want to go to these, you know, the scenarios where there's multiple people living, living in a, in a complex. Um, they want to be uh, independent for a long time. And in those type of scenarios, you know, there, there are tools that are out there like med uh, medical alert necklaces or brace bracelets that you can wear that if they're in distress, they would press the button um, and, you know, somebody would come out and help. The problem, though, is that a lot of times, you know, they won't want to wear the device or they'll forget to wear the device. And I've, I've seen this scenario happen a lot. Uh, and then, you know, when they're in distress, if, if they've fallen or if they've gotten hurt uh, and they don't have the ability to call, how do you ensure that support is, is put out there for them? So this was, you know, a, a big challenge in terms of the ask of how do we address this problem? So initially, you know, the conversation was, okay, well, we'll put cameras in the home and the cameras will constantly monitor this individual. That's a bit evasive, right? That means that you now have this camera 24 seven in your home with somebody monitoring that camera or artificial intelligence monitoring that camera. And that becomes a challenge with ethics. Is that, you know, something that's responsible to do? Is that going to be uh, something that's going to be accepted by the general public and having these cameras? What about from a security perspective? You know, there's a lot of things that you have to take into consideration when you're doing that type of implementation. What the team actually came back with was, hey, what about instead of having an optical camera inside of the home, we implemented an infrared camera and having that information and, and understanding that the individual, you're not seeing their face, you're not seeing, you know, where where they specifically are inside of the in, in, inside of their space,
But if you're doing it from an IR camera uh, and understanding the heat mass traveling throughout the house, you know, now you can be more proficient in understanding that, hey, this, you know, individual hasn't moved during this, this certain period of time. Is there a problem? Um, and it's understanding the patterns travel throughout the house during the day. You know, this is the, the time that they sit down and watch their favorite TV program. This is the time that they go and feed their pet. It was more beneficial to have this type of scenario through IR that safeguarded the individual's identity and imagery of that individual uh, from the aspect of understanding the living patterns of the of that person inside their home. And so this became proficient in terms of dealing with the, the situation of having cameras inside of the home. Uh, having IR, you know, was much more accepted because your face is not not actually showing up uh, anywhere inside the inside of the data. Uh, obviously, it had to be accepted by the individual living at the home. But the benefit here was the individual didn't have to do anything, right? So that individual, you know, if they if they came in distress, you know, they would they would stop they would stop moving and and the system would kick in and say, hey, I've noticed that you have you, know, you haven't gone seen your program. Your program's on right now. You're still in the same spot. Is everything okay? Notification can happen on the smartphone to the individual themselves. If they don't respond within the specific period of time, their loved ones, or if they have the uh, services that are monitoring this solution can be notified. Uh, this is, you know, th the benefit of this is again, it's not a camera in your face. It's not capturing your facial uh, information. It's capturing your heat map, you as a heat mass, uh, as you walk through your home and being proficient in, you know, I don't have to wear a, ne a necklace or a bracelet to, to call emergency services, the solution itself can do it on my behalf, which is a huge, uh, huge implementation. Uh, still in testing out in uh, Eastern Canada that they're looking through this type of solution right now. The information on this project, again, available aka.ms forward slash home accept. What I loved about this was, again, it wasn't about the inclusion of technology as a focal point. It was how do we responsibly utilize the tools that are out there that does not invade into an individual's privacy and it but still enables uh or assistance of that individual when they're in distress one of the last things i want to walk uh i want to share with everybody with here and, and really drive home is of all the technology that was showcased and highlighted today it's all based on your creativity the individuals that go forth and look through the examples that we shared with today really take it to the next level. And I really appreciate that uh, from a perspective of learning. I love to see how you go forward and really evolve you know, a lot of the solutions and, and implementations that have been shared with you today and take it to the next level. And it's 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 something that I then take away you know, and learn from how this is being implemented, how this is uh, being put forth. Uh, I love the fact that, you know, the creativity that's there doesn't limit it to just the mousetrap for being for mice, right? And being extended to, you know, ice cream trucks and newspaper boxes and what have you. Uh, in terms of the drone, looking at agricultural uh, scenarios as opposed to just, you know, saving people uh, in distress. I love the fact that you're taking this these scenarios and these projects to the next level. Continue to do that. You are the focal point to all the opportunities that are out there. It's the people that are involved. The technology is there. Uh, it's an important tool, but it's not the focal point. The focal point at the end of the day is you and your creativity is what drives that forward. So if you have any questions or if there's any uh, concerns that you have or, you know, not able to gain access to any information, feel free, free to reach out to me uh, at Wireless Life on Twitter. Uh, happy to field your questions and share information with you. And with that, uh, there's also the Microsoft Learn modules that are available free resource that you can go forward to. I've actually created a collection specifically on IoT visual that can run you through scenarios of IoT and scenarios of custom vision that you can implement in type in types of solutions for learning, right? So again, this is not a focal point, but if you're looking at adopting these type of scenarios and, and uh, services, do check this out. It's a completely free resource that you can go forth and, and do under, uh, and get some comprehension around the services that we talked about today beyond the, the source code that's available. Uh, and that's it for me uh, in terms of my talk. So thank you very much. And again, if you have any questions, please do share them with me on Twitter at Wireless Life. Happy to field your questions or leave them in the comments uh, from the video. You can see that it's here available in the comment section and we'll address those as well. With that, thank you very much again for joining me today and we'll talk to you soon.